Hi, my name's Roger, and I want to talk about the fact that there are a lot of clinicians out there who are really struggling to find the right equipment right now, particularly ventilators, and there are a lot of tinkerers and engineers who are trying really hard to help, but there seems to be a bit of a disconnect between what it is that's actually going to improve outcomes and what it is that the engineers are proposing to build. This isn't something that I think is an issue for medical device development companies. They've been doing this kind of thing for years. A lot of my colleagues in the UK are doing work on this already. Uh, there are lots of companies in the US doing this with clinician support. Where I do think this could be valuable is where there are situations where you don't have that kind of company infrastructure, you don't have good healthcare infrastructure, and you desperately need something which is gonna provide enough functionality. Places like Syria and Sudan, where there have been a couple of cases recently, which is gonna turn into tens of thousands of cases very quickly, and there is gonna be a need for this kind of system. Here is a list of 10 things that your system absolutely has to do in order to be a functional mechanical ventilator system. If your system does some of these things, but not all, then it still might be viable components of a system, but it's not a complete system. You have to combine it with other elements before you can present it to a clinician and say that it could help a patient. So let's start from the top with number one, timing. Two key aspects of timing. There is inhalation versus expiration rate, and there is breath rate. Now inhalation to expiration rate could be one to one, or it could be all the way up to three to one, or any range in between. As in one to one, you breathe out for the same amount of time that you breathe in, or the, the one to three, three to one, whichever way around you want to call it, you breathe out for three times as long as you breathe in. So the exhale is longer than the inhale. And the breathing rate could be anywhere from 10 to 30 breaths per minute. And this is important because different patients have different breath rate requirements. This is the same for the inhale and the exhale. The clinician is going to want to tune these according to the patient's specific requirements. Number two, this is the one that everybody understands. You need positive pressure. In order to inflate the lungs, you need to push down into the lung. What you do need to do, however, is maintain that pressure at an acceptable level. So somewhere between 30 and 70 centimeters of water. You also need to make sure that you have enough volume. A good volume to aim for is about 400 milliliters, but if you want to be precise about it, then you should be looking at four to six milliliters per kilogram of the patient. This is another example of how different patients have different requirements and need different ventilator systems or adjustment on a single ventilator system. The third thing is PEEP regulation. So PEEP pressure is positive end expiratory pressure. This enables your lungs to stay inflated even when there's no air coming out of them. The way that you do this is you maintain a positive pressure. So you put in a lot of pressure when you're trying to get someone to breathe in, and then you relax that pressure, but you don't take it all the way to zero. And this stops the alveoli, the, the bits in the lung that absorb the oxygen from collapsing, from going to these little balls, from going to these flat sections where the air can't get in anymore. If you don't have the peak pressure, the alveoli can collapse and the lung will become far less efficient and long-term usage of a ventilator system that isn't doing this will be very detrimental for the patient. Number four, it needs to not interfere with their existing lung function. The first way of doing this is possibly also the most detrimental to the patient, which is providing them with some kind of drugs, which are either a uh, essentially a lung function suppressant, a paralytic or a sedative, which means that their muscles aren't doing the breathing anymore. This means the machine can do everything, but it means that those muscles are no longer being used. And so the longer that person is on the ventilator for, the harder it's gonna be for them to come off the ventilator. It's acceptable, it's done, but it's very difficult to come off it once you've started. Second thing here, sensors. If you can sense when a person is trying to breathe in, you look for that little pressure drop, then you can provide a positive pressure at that time, which is gonna help them breathe. This means you've got a sense. You can sense either a little pressure drop when they breathe in, or maybe you could sense the expansion of their rib cage, but you've got to respond to their body, which makes it more complicated for your system. And I've put here other, 
because I think that there are other ways of doing this. I think that there's a method by which you don't need to know what the patient is doing and you also don't need to suppress what the patient is doing and there's little detrimental effect. I've seen some uh, negative pressure systems like an iron lung um, where you exert a negative pressure on the abdomen to help a patient breathe rather than a positive pressure on the face. I think that one doesn't need breath sensing or drugs. Number five, preventing overinflation of the lung. If you put too much pressure into a person's lung, it will cause damage. And so here the absolute maximum limit is 80 millimeters, sorry, 80 centimeters of water. This is probably still gonna cause damage for some people. This is essentially a fail safe. This is a safety mechanism. And if you look at my previous video, I describe ways that you can achieve uh, two, three, and five on this list using water bottles and hoses. Number six, clean air in or an O2 source. This is important because if a patient is gonna be on this system for any length of time, any, any particulates, any oils, any dirt, any bacteria that are getting to this system are going to make their situation worse. It's going to make their outcomes worse. Additional O2 means that the patient can breathe better because they, they just have more oxygen available. Uh, so that improves that situation. So this, this is a benefit. It's really good to have this. Humid air and temperature. When you mechanically ventilate somebody, if you intubate them, you are bypassing the nose, the nasal cavity, or the mouth and the throat. And so all these sources of moisture and warmth don't exist anymore. So you need to have another source of moisture and warmth going into the body in order for the lung to function normally. If you don't have that, you're gonna be sucking out moisture from the lungs far more quickly than you would normally if you were breathing naturally. So the air coming in needs to be humidified. Warming up helps as well because warm air holds more moisture. So if you can warm to about body temperature, then you can incorporate more moisture into the air and it will dry out the lungs less. Number eight, really, really important thing. This system might have to operate for 10 or more days. Conventional ventilator systems now, even the ones that, are, that have been designed by uh, medical development companies that have been in use for decades, their typical use life on a single patient is two to three days if you have a typical pneumonia case. COVID cases are sometimes going for up to 10 days. If you've got 10 days, 20 breaths per minute, just picking the middle of the range, 60 minutes in an hour, 24 hours in a day, that puts you at 290,000 cycles, 290,000 breaths that this system has to survive for. So you need to bear in mind when you're designing any bearings, any, uh, any pinch valves, any tubes that are oscillating, any wires that are moving backwards and forwards, um, any sliding surfaces, those surfaces are gonna go through almost 300,000 cycles before this patient is gonna be disconnected from that regulator system. Number nine, this is really important to clinicians, the ability to check that the system is working. You need to be able to see that there is air going into the patient. You need to be able to make sure that the pressure that the air is being delivered at is correct. You need to be confident that that patient isn't going to get a, uh, an overpressure, um, isn't going to lose the pressure during the course of their treatment if the clinician walks away for 10 minutes. No clinician is gonna plug something in that hasn't been tested, hasn't gone through the same verification and validation processes that medical equipment usually goes through unless they can see that it's working, unless they can look at something and say, yep, that is delivering the air that it needs to. And number 10, so important for any design, especially important for any design that is trying to keep people alive. You've got to consider how it might fail. You want to keep the patient safe and you want to keep the doctor safe. So what are the things in the system that could go wrong and how do you cope when it does go wrong? Do you have redundancies? So part of it can fail, but it doesn't matter because you have another system that can take over. Do you have the ability to swap in a new system 
when the old system fails quickly? Do you have, can you attach a BVM manually if your ventilation system fails so that you can keep the patient going while another system is connected or while that other system is repaired? And what could go wrong that could harm the doctor? Doctors are a scarce resource. They are a valuable resource. And if you are harming a doctor, then you're making a situation much worse. And this is where this final item comes up, the outlet filtration. You could say this isn't essential. It depends on the environment that you're in. If you're surrounded by 10, 15 other patients and you're on this ventilator system and all of your viral load is coming out of your ventilator and being shared with the other patients, everyone's viral load is increasing. It's going to have a negative outcome for a lot of people. Equally, the doctors and nurses who are in that environment are going to struggle to keep that viral load out of their bodies. So if you can filter in that situation, it's hugely beneficial. Where you might be able to get away without it, where it might be acceptable to not have this, is if you have a single patient who you can isolate really effectively, but who still needs the ventilation system. So this is really beneficial, but not necessary. I hope that this provides a bit of a leg up for people who are trying to design ventilator systems who don't have a medical device background, who haven't worked in this area before, who are trying to create something with the equipment that they have to hand in difficult situations where you don't have healthcare infrastructure, any situation like that. I really hope that this, hope that this helps. If you have any questions, uh, please do drop something in the comments or, um, or message me directly and I will try and get back to you. If it's something that I feel like I am equipped to answer, then I will do my best. If it's not, then I will try and direct you to somebody who I think is more capable of answering the question, or I'll go away and, and look at the problem and perhaps talk about it in a, in a future video.